Und da kommt eben noch zehn Minuten Tagessets und eingebaut nach dem, was aber der letzte Report hat. Hallo. Willkommen in Zeitlei wieder. Wir sind jetzt beim Vortrag Flux, Making Fun Smarter. And as this talk is in English, I will switch to English as well. Um, so, I will shortly introduce the speaker. However, this is a pre-recorded talk, so uh, the talk was already done, but we are happy enough to have uh, Simon Cousins with us and he will be available for questions at the end of the talk. So you can ask your questions in IRC. I guess you will also be able to uh, see it there, but I will then uh, collect them and yeah, ask them at the end. So Simon Cousins is a true font engineer, not to confuse with front or front end engineer. Um, so it's actually about fonts. He has a background in missionary and anthropology, uh, or as an anthropology teacher, and uh, in his time abroad, he came into contact with things like Japanese fonts. Um, so very different stuff, I guess. Um, and these days, he develops the Sile typesetting engine together with Caleb McLennan, and also the flux project is uh, of his i guess and that's what he is going to present in the next 17 minutes so have fun uh, bitte entschuldige mich ich spreche nicht sehr gut deutsch deshalb werde ich den rest dieses vortrags auf englisch halten entschuldigung I want to talk to you today about a project that I've been working on, uh, a project called Flux. And Flux is a font layout editor. So first of all, let's have a think about what that means. I don't know if you've ever wondered what is inside a font file, what a font actually is. I've got a piece of software here called TTX which can take apart a font and look inside it. And we can see, when I open up a, an ordinary TTF file here, that a font is basically a database. And you can see a list of tables on the left. You can see how long they are and where they start in the file. So what do those tables do? Well, we've got some metadata, uh, a header, we have some information about the metrics, how large things are in the font, how big a glyph is, how uh, far below the baseline it descends, how wide each glyph is, where it starts, and so on. We've got another table which maps Unicode code points to glyph IDs in the font. So inside the font there are a bunch of glyphs, a bunch of shapes, and they have their own IDs, and so we have a mapping uh, between those and Unicode code points, so that when you type an S, we know which glyph we're going to get. Now, I say that's an initial mapping. We'll come on to that a bit later. Then we have some information about hinting, which I'm not going to go into today. And then finally, we come to the actual outlines, the shapes of the letters themselves. Then there's a bit more metadata. The name table has got copyright information, the name of the font and things like that, text strings. And then down at the bottom, we've got these two tables, GPOS and GSUB. And you'll notice that GPOS is very big. It's almost as big as the outlines themselves. So what's going on here? Well, OpenType allows you to change the way that the font operates. It contains some programming information inside it uh, with rules to substitute different glyphs and to change the positioning of glyphs. So you may have noticed that uh, when you're typing in uh, the Latin script and you have a serif font like this Garamond on the left here, uh, you type letters F F I and it changes it into a ligature. There is code inside the font to take the glyphs that it sees coming in and change them around and change them into a different glyph. So you can see on the bottom left there that FFI 
is now a single glyph designed in a different way and it's been substituted by a rule stored inside the font. Similarly, you may be familiar with kerning, moving the shapes of letters together. On the top right, there's a lot of space between the A and the V and the V and the A. And we can write a kerning rule which brings together these letters and tightens them up. And again, this is a rule stored inside the font in the GPOS table, which is processed as the font uh, text is laid out. So we have substitution rules and positioning rules. And when you are writing in the Latin script, uh, these just make your letters look a little bit nicer. They're refinements, they tidy things up a bit. If you're working with other scripts, then these things become absolutely essential. This is what it looks like to lay out a piece of Urdu text using substitution and positioning rules. If we didn't have those rules in the font, it would just look ridiculous. It wouldn't work at all. So for Latin script, open type substitution and positioning rules make your font look nicer. For all other scripts, they make your font work. Just to kind of recap that and bring it back together, um, I want to show you how the open type, the font system that's, that's most commonly in use works in one slide. On the right, you have the text that's coming into the system, things that you type, things that you read from a file. On the left, you have a font. It's got the metrics that tell you how big things are, and it's got these rules that we've talked about, the substitution and the positioning rules. And in the middle, we have something called a shaping engine. In Linux, that's a piece of software called HalfBuzz. And the job of the shaping engine is to take the text and apply the rules and apply the metrics and work out how this should be laid out. So in this particular font, there's a ligature that combines the E and the R into one glyph. And uh, the system will tell us which glyph IDs we have and how wide they are. That's the job of the shaping engine. And then you have another piece of software called a rasterizer. In Linux, that's uh, usually free type. And that goes and gets the outlines from the font and draws them on your screen or on your printer. How do we get these rules, these substitution and these positioning rules that we've talked about, into the font? Well, for some of them, it's quite simple. Uh, kerning, moving the glyphs together horizontally, is usually done in the font editor, and there's a nice interface to that. Some of the substitution rules, like the FFI ligature, can be automatically generated based on the names of the glyphs. But for anything else, uh, you're on your own. This is uh, an example of an Arabic font, uh, Khaled Hosni's Amiri project, um, and in some circumstances you need to enclose numbers inside this uh, oval glyph. And you can see that he's got some rules here which move the letters into the right positions. And it's horrible to have to write these things out by hand. These are written in a language called uh, Adobe Feature Syntax, uh, a kind of a semi-programming language that uh, Adobe have provided for getting open type rules into a font. But what we're actually asking designers to do designers who are normally visual people uh, to write out this code themselves and it's it's not a lot of fun and this is why you have the job of a font engineer to come up with this this coding themselves but what if there was a better way to do it what if there was a visual way to put these rules into the font well that's what I'm trying to write with the flux project now, there's one more Niggle, since about 2016, we've had uh, something called variable fonts, where one font can define how it changes in different axes. So here you can see a font which is getting uh, bolder and less bold by sliding up and down the weight axis. So one font is doing the job of regular and medium and bold. Now, when you have a variable font like that, you need also to have variable layout. 
rules, positioning rules for example, which can change as the font changes along its design space. This is what I've been trying to write with Flux. Here you can see the main interface to Flux, the main window. You load up a font in its source format and you start typing on the top right. And on the left you see the list of different rules that are being applied. And on the bottom right, left you see the order in which they're being applied. And on the bottom right you see how that then changes the input text into a set of glyphs. I'm going to show you this in a bit more detail as we look at the demo. So to demonstrate how Flux works I'm going to do a little bit of engineering on a Devanagari font. Devanagari is a script used to write Hindi and other Indian languages. When we open up Flux we get this dialogue asking us to open a font source file. So we're going to start using the outlines from a font called Hind by Indian Type Factory. This is a glyphs file, so we'll load that up now. And once that's opened up, you see the main window we talked about earlier. Here are the groups of glyphs defined in the source file, uh, such as the, the marks and the bases that we'll use in a moment. The text that we want to shape and we can type in our own text here. And the first thing we're going to get working is what's called Nukta forms. These are modified forms of a letter and they take a particular form with a dot underneath but the dot is placed in a particular way. So let's get that working to start with. Here's the letter Ka and the Nukta but that Nukta is in the wrong place. So we're going to add a routine which is a collection of rules. We're going to call it Nukta and we want to substitute it with another glyph in the font. So when we see the letter ka followed by that nukta sign, we're going to replace that glyph with a different glyph, the letter kxa, which is a precomposed glyph the designer has put the nukta in the right place for us. And we create that rule. And then we can go on and do it for the next letter and the next letter and the next letter. But that's really boring, so we're not going to do that. One of the nice things about Flux is that it is pluggable and you can add your own plugins. There are a bunch of plugins here. We've got a regular expression plugin, which will allow us to create our Nuxa substitution by saying any glyphs that end in A, we're going to replace that final A with XA only when we see the letter Nukta afterwards. And that gives us a whole set of rules which do what we want. And you can see that they're stored in italics because they're computed based on that regular expression. Now to make that work, we're going to put that into a feature which tells the shaper what to do with it. We're going to put it in the Nukt feature, which is for Nukta forms, and then you'll see that that is now automatically applied in this case. So that's Nukta forms sorted out. The next thing that we're going to get working is the letter I, the vowel sign I. Now in Devanagari normally the vowels go above or under the word or uh, the letter, but the letter I actually goes before it. So if I type an I here, you can see that it's gone before the uh, letter K. The I is the one that looks like a sort of hook. And you can see here we typed ka e, we typed a k and an i, but our shaper to help us put the i beforehand because the i has to appear visually beforehand, even though in Unicode it goes afterwards. What we need to do is make sure that the hook of the i is the right length. On the left it's fine, but when we've got the letter la, which is quite wide, our normal hook isn't wide enough. Our designer has given us a bunch of different I forms up here of different widths, so we have to connect them together. Thankfully, there's a plugin which does that. Uh, we tell it the set of consonants that we have. We tell it the basic I form, the one that you get if you just press the letter I. And we tell it all the variant widths that we have. And it will go away 
and work out the right width to apply to each letter. There you go. You can see that that one is a width 2 and then there are others of different widths. If we add that to our presentation feature, then you can see now that it has formed the right width and got it pointing at that downward stem. So we've seen different ways of doing substitution rules. Now we want to look at a positioning rule. And um, I'm going to go back and have a look at this Nukta uh, again that we created before. You remember that when we created it before, it was a pre-composed glyph. The designer had put a glyph in there with the dot in the right place. Want to do things a bit of a different way. Why can't we do it just by moving the dot to the right place? Well, we can do that. Let's get rid of our old Nukta rules and create a new routine. And this time we're going to use a positioning rule. Um, opening up gives us a blank positioning rule. We say when we find the letter ka, again followed by uh, the nukta, we want to move that nukta around. And uh, that will change the advance, which I don't want to do. This will change the position. Uh, X direction, getting it in the right place. And in the Y direction, we're kerning in both dimensions here, which is not something you can do in your editor. This is what you need a specialist layout editor to do. And we can create a bunch of rules like that and place them into our Nukta feature as before. And without requiring additional glyphs, we've got the Nukta doing the right thing. Now there's more that we can do with this. We can say that the rule should only apply with particular glyphs before and afterwards. If we had a multiple master font, we could do variable positioning rules, which I'm not going to show you today. Uh, let's have a look, say, at one more plugin. Remember I told you that font editors can do some automatic substitution rules based on the glyph names. Well, we can do that too. This is the name-based features plugin, and it goes and sees uh, what's available in the font. It's found some standard ligatures, the standard Latin ligatures, and it's going to add those to us automatically. It's found uh, FI, FL, FFI, and so on, and it's added those to the standard ligatures feature for us. Now, once you've got your font working, you can uh, export it as Adobe Feature File. You can export it as a finalized font, and you're done. So that's Flux. It's an open source project. It's a Python project. It's written in PyQt5. And if you want to try it out, you can get the latest version from GitHub. If you're using OS X, then you can uh, uh, get a, a built application file from GitHub Artifacts. Otherwise, you can clone it on Git and uh, use it yourself. Um, and please let me know uh, how you're getting on, how you're using it. Uh, and if it isn't doing anything that you think it should do. Thank you very much for watching today. Uh, and I also want to sp say a special thank you to Google Fonts because they have put a lot into supporting the development of this project. So thank you very much to them. And I hope you enjoy the other talks. Hello. So thanks for the great talk. Uh, already, Simon. And we will now go to the Q&A part. Uh, I already saw some questions in IRC. I already saw that you were busy answering some of them. Uh, I will still repeat them. Maybe you have got some more time to think about it and have some uh, more in-depth answers as well. So I will start with uh, the question from Alf. Is there a difference between text kerning and open type kerning? Does it work the same way? Yeah, the, um, the kerning in tech is a lot more simple. Uh, in tech, you have a dictionary of left glyph and right glyph and the uh, value to move them forwards and backwards. That's all you can do. Uh, but in open type, you can do a lot more. You can move things up, up and down. Uh, you can move the glyphs independently. And you can also do all of this conditionally on what comes before or what comes afterwards. So open type uh, is a lot more sophisticated. You couldn't do any of these um, non-Latin scripts in tech very easily. 
Okay, cool. Thanks. I will continue. We have a few more. Uh, Master Luke asks, considering the Urdu text, would it also make sense to shape the CJK text using radicals, ignoring other technical reasons like Unicode, as you mentioned? Okay, so this is a question about Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. And Chinese, Japanese, and Korean fonts uh, script, uh, the characters are made up of little radicals kind of stuck together. Um, so, you know, any uh, character that's got to do with water will have the water radical on one side and then something else on the other side. Uh, and I guess the question is, can we do the shaping based on these radicals? The answer is uh, not, unfortunately, uh, but it is becoming now more possible to do the font design based on these radicals. Um, in the past, to develop uh, a Chinese font, a Japanese font, a Korean font would take um, many people many years. It's a, it's a long project because we're talking maybe 10,000, 50,000 glyphs in a font that all have to be designed by hand. Uh, but now um, there's been a lot of work on making variable radicals. So you have this basic form of the water radical, and then that can be sort of dynamically uh, reshaped and stretched and so on to fit with whatever goes on the other side. And I know somebody else is working on a project of um, composing these things together using machine learning. So there are lots of interesting th things happening with uh, CJK fonts at the moment, but not in the shape I'm afraid. Okay, um, cool. We have uh, one or two more. It's like the one is what is Imatra, and maybe it's is it the same for arbitrary names for Nuktra? And the second one, I will combine them. Uh, I think is um, what is the relationship of dot glyphs files and dot otf files, and are they convertible? <laughs> Okay, so the first question uh, was about when I was doing that engineering, when I was showing you the, the uh, Devnagari font, I was creating these routines. And routines are sets of rules that go together. So when we did the, when we sorted out the Nukta, uh, we had a bunch of routines, substitute this for this, substitute this for this, and they were all related rules. Um, and a, a lookup is almost like a subroutine in a programming language. Uh, so we gave it an arbitrary name. I gave it the name Nukta. It could have been anything. But uh, what then needs to happen for the shaping to work is that uh, the shaper has a number of what we call features. And it calls these features one after another. Um, and for example, to process Nuktas, it uh, does one called Nukt. And then inside the Nukt, we, we put our collections of rules so that the shaper then went and executed those rules so it knows which ones to do for which purpose. So yes, the, the names that we created were arbitrary, but then you have to drag them down into the bottom so that the shaper knows what to do with them. Uh, the other question was about glyphs files and OTF files. When you're designing a font, when you're drawing a font, you will use a piece of software like uh, Glyphs or uh, FontForge for open source, uh, and they store their data in um, a source format. So it's almost like the source of your program. And then the OTF is the binary. Uh, so it gets compiled by uh, something like Flux or something like the, the Glyphs editor or FontForge. And that gets compiled into the binary that then is used on other people's systems. So it's not really convertible, or just in one way to answer the question, or yeah, I, I'm working it. on that. I've written a, <laughs> <laughs> I've written a piece of software called Babel Font, which is uh, converts between all of the different source formats and all of the different binary formats. I'm trying to do something that sort of takes everything and then puts it back out again. Um, and I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> about, uh, okay, so this is a question about the rules generated by Flux. Can you validate them? And is the output of Flux always syntactically correct? So there are two ways of looking at this. Um, at the moment, Flux generates these Adobe uh, text files um, in this Adobe feature language. Yes, I can guarantee that they are always syntactically co correct Adobe 
uh, script because of the way that it, it generates them. There's a, a Python module that takes like an abstract representation. I want to move this to there. Um, and then the Python library can um, emit the Adobe rule, and it will be syntactically correct. But uh, what I'm trying to move towards is uh, having Flux compile the binary itself. So these rules are stored in the OTF file in a binary format. Um, and I've almost got it working that Flux can just write those binary rules straight into the font. Oh, I think there were um, all questions from IRC, ISA. Uh, I have a, another question from my side. Uh, you, you said uh, it's possible to write plugins. Um, did yeah. you document that as well, or is there any easy way to look into that? <laughs> There's not much documentation yet, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, oh, there was one more question, which was how long does it take to make a complete font for a script like that? So we're talking like a, a Devnagari, a Hindi font. Um, I think it probably wouldn't take too long for uh, uh, the engineer now, especially because they have some software like Flux. Uh, what would normally happen is that a designer would design the letters, uh, and that takes a remarkably long time. It can take um, maybe a year, two, three years, uh, especially if you're working on a variable font where you've got you know different weights uh, and different widths and things like that. Uh, yeah, it can be a multi-year project for a single designer. Um, but then to um, do the engineering, hopefully now that we have Flux, now that we have all of these tools, it can be a lot faster. It can be a matter of a couple of weeks. OK, thank you all very much for your questions. And uh, get in touch if you want to play with this some more. Cool. Then also thanks from my side. Uh, I think we are done here. And in about 15 minutes, there will be the next talk in this uh, yeah, room three. And it will be about uh, erhöhte Datensicherheit und Privatfälle durch Edge Computing. So I think it will be in German again. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> Bye.